I'm at the helm of the Bluefin training vessel, bringing vital supplies of hot chocolate to a research team stranded somewhere off the coast of Tasmania. If anything were to go wrong, then there are a million dollars worth of boat, research equipment, and of course, hot chocolate, which I could be liable for. Or would be liable for if this were an actual boat. This is the Center for Marine Simulations at the University of Tasmania. It's in this very room where they train pilots to operate in some of the most difficult and technical situations in the world. And today, we're going to find out how it works. When you're trying to replicate the real world inside a computer, the best place to begin is the real world. This is the actual bluefin vessel, safely moored at Beauty Point. For most of us, the hardest thing about getting into a new hire car is setting up the Bluetooth. This is because all cars handle pretty much the same. There is a very high amount of friction between the road and the car tires, and on top of that, the ratio of engine power to vehicle mass is pretty high. Not so with a boat. First of all, there's very low resistance between the water and the ship's hull, and although the engines are massive on this sort of boat, their power is quite small as compared with the enormous mass of the ship. Combined with high inertia due to this mass, and the effect of wind and wave forces, this makes precise steering really difficult. Ships won't just travel in a straight line either, but will heave, yaw, surge, roll, sway and pitch their way across the sea. How all these unique forces interact with each other in order to produce the vessel's unique sailing signature makes simulating it both incredibly important, but also very difficult to achieve. In order to create our simulations, we need a lot of data. Rather than waiting for the ocean to produce just the right sort of conditions in order to test our theories, the engineers at the Australian Maritime College decided to skip out the middleman and make their own ocean. I'm inside what's called the Model Test Basin. At one end, we have a series of paddles, but I like to think of them as keys on a piano, with which we hope to replicate the symphony of the seas. If we have them all move together, as they're doing now, then they'll push on the water in the exact same way to produce a plane wavefront of uniform frequency. This is the simplest type, and it's really good for testing our theories. If we were to instead play each of these paddles individually and use some real life data, then we can almost exactly replicate what it's like to be on the ocean. At 35 meters by 12 meters, the model test basin is huge. But since it's only about 800 millimeters deep, it's not quite large enough for us to test the actual bluefin shipping. For that, I'm going to introduce to you our third, and in my opinion, favorite bluefin model of the day. This is a 1 to 20 scale exact replica of the real Bluefin ship. This means that for every 1 millimeter on the model, we have 20 millimeters in real life. It's also remote controlled. By scaling wave height by the same factor, we can see how the boat responds to a variety of sea states as it conducts a few different maneuvers. By using the same tracking system as movie studios use to make CGI characters, we can track the motion of the boat to a very high level of precision. As we saw with our Engineering Europe series, a ship is stable if its center of buoyancy is directly above its center of mass. When we introduce waves, we complicate the situation by dynamically changing the center of buoyancy. Compared with its equilibrium position, this incoming wave will submerge more of the bow and less of the stern. This means that we have more of the lift up front and less at the back, pushing the center of buoyancy further forward than the center of mass. This torque causes the ship to pitch upward. As the wave continues to pass through, it becomes level before pitching the other way. If we reduce wavelength, we can have a much smoother ride since the differences in buoyancy for each part of the hull will cancel each other out. You can artificially adjust what frequency of wave your boat is experiencing and get a smoother ride by adjusting the angle and speed with which you encounter these waves. However, to more rigorously analyze speed, we're going to have to make a new model. A few years ago, part of my summer research job was to create some very similar models as to these ones for a large resources company. As it turns out, this is actually a far more complex task than it might first appear. 
On this small scale, even very minute differences between the model and real world will result in massive differences in the sort of forces and behaviours that we're measuring. On top of that, you've also got to replicate the overall density as well as the moment of inertia, because if not, then they're just going to behave like completely different vessels. These models are built in-house at a cost of between $5,000 and $60,000. You can paint them either yellow or pink in order to get the best view of the different fluid properties going on. You think you can guess why they went for yellow. For longer sections of travel, we have a towing tank. At one end, we have a wave generator, allowing us to produce any sort of sea state that we want. And here is the carriage. It moves along the 100 meter towing tank through which we drag along the boat. You can see here we've created a positive feedback loop, where the wavelength of the wave is equal to the length of the boat. The passengers would not be having a good time. Since the researchers conducting this particular experiment only cared about heave and pitch, we reduced the degrees of freedom and measure forces by using these two cylindrical extenders. We've done the tests and collected our data, but you've probably noticed that the motion looks a little bit strange. It's going much faster than we'd expect in the real world. Let's imagine a 10 meter tall ship and its 10 centimeter high 1 to 100 scale model. Now, for whatever reason, something has dropped from the top of the mast and into the sea below. Assuming a spherical cow in a vacuum, a little bit of high school physics should tell us that it will take 1.4 seconds for the real object to fall 10 meters, but only 0.14 seconds for the scale object to fall 10 centimeters. Remember, we've only changed the scale of the ship. Gravity remains constant. To make them match, we slow down the recording specifically by the square root of the scale factor. That is 10 for the 1 to 100 spherical cow and 4.47 for the 1 to 20 bluefin. At this scale, things look more realistic and significantly more cool. This same technique is used in old school disaster movies where they make a small scale model of the explosion, film it, and then play it back in slow motion. I'm back at the Marine Simulation Center. This is their tugboat model, which allows crews to test really complex maneuvers which require both a tugboat as well as the actual vessel in order to operate correctly. This gives them a really hands-on practical experience of how to use a boat. On top of them having two different crews which can operate together, the actual boat physics and how the simulations work is incredibly accurate because of all those tests we ran earlier. For example, if I do a massive turn immediately, the boat takes some time to respond, just because of how the different forces operate, because of our momentum and the ship conditions. With enough measurements from towing tanks, test basins, and of course, ship trials, the team here can simulate almost any vessel in any condition in the world. When you see a boat come into port doing a particularly complex maneuver or operating on the high seas, you can be certain that at least one person aboard spent a very good deal of time in this simulator. I, meanwhile, should probably get back to my Arctic research team. They'll be wanting their hot chocolate any day now. Until next time, this has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up. Huge thanks to everyone from the University of Tasmania who made this video possible, and in particular to Tom, Richard and Nick. Next episode, we're going to go visit one of the world's most unique robots. See you then.